and welcome to TVP number 142, uh, Community Technology by Carl Hess. Uh, so yeah, alongside the official release of the paperback version of Community Technology uh, via Libertarian Attack Publications, here's the audiobook narrated by our friend Sek Magora over at uh, the Agora podcast. Uh, Hess indeed brought a lot of value to the realm of direct action, uh, as well as possibilities when it comes to volunteering in cities, uh, at least in the area of uh, you know independence. Now, please enjoy and pick up your paperback copy of Community Technology by visiting libertyunderattack.com forward slash Hess. Again, to pick up your copy of Community Technology, just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash Hess. Please enjoy. Hi there. This is Sek Magora. I'm reading this book today in association with Agora, the podcast. You can find Agora, the podcast, on Anchor and Spotify. You can find me on Telegram at SECMAGORA, all caps, that's S-E-K-M-C-G-O-R-A. The book I'm reading today is Community Technology by the late Carl Hess, written in 1979, and I hope you enjoy it. Community Technology by Carl Hess, Chapter 1 There is not a single large institution or organization in the world today that is satisfactorily performing all of the functions people have assigned to it. They are creaking, cracking, and even crashing under their own weight. Everywhere people sense that things are going to hell. Yet people themselves persist, contrive to survive, even make things better. And more and more, they do all of those things less and less direct reference to major institutions. People seem to be going one way, institutions another. The largest of all institutions, the nation-state, maintains itself by sheer force in much of the world. Even where it is supposed to be supported popularly, the old enthusiasms wane. In America, fewer than a third of eligible voters elected the last president. America's most recent war, usually the proudest activity of the nation-state, was the shambles. What more and more people seem to want most from their government is for it to go away, after, of course, handing out the particular favor which is seen as its only redeeming grace. Churches sag at the institutional level and are revitalizing at the local level in new sects, evangelism, mysteries. The largest of the tightly organized churches, the Roman Catholic, is fra fracturing and sliding like a geological mass, with its adherents going their way, the papal leadership going the another. Cities, virtually all of them, seem to have reached the limits of satisfaction having to do with size and the cost of size. New York remains the largest city, and also the most precarious, the most dubious, the most perilous. Size has not saved it. Size seems to have damned it. In cities where there seems to be a rebirth of confidence and possibility, there is also a rebirth of life in the smallest of civic units, the neighborhood. Schools, failing all along the line, have also, also grown all along the line, with the one-room schools giving way to the town schools and those more recently giving away to the consolidated schools. The shiny new buildings and the conglomerated classes produced what? Crisis in literacy and a few winning football teams. Now school bond issues have a tough time passing anywhere. The police get tanks, helicopters, bulletproof vests, and a lifetime subscription to the CIA. The muggers get bolder, the rapes go up, and no one ever did bother to get some cops to watch the executives. Hospitals glisten like command nod modules of a spacecraft. Rare and wonderful surgery is performed. Medical miracles keep making the headlines and a long siege of an ordinary illness bankrupts people. Meantime, back at the lab, 
One group of scientists spends millions to research a medical cure for cancer, while another group spends other millions proving that the major causes of cancer are environmental. The Surgeon General condemns smoking. The Secretary of Agriculture helps stimulate tobacco farming. Everybody condemns the Arabs that when they raise oil prices, then say how shrewd a business deal it is for American companies to own so much of the world's largest oil producer, Aramco, in Saudi Arabia. Ronald Reagan keeps talking about getting big government out of our lives, then drums it up for the military occupation of our Panama Canal, higher defense budgets, and more freedom for government security agents to poke and probe and even shoot wherever they want. Leftists condemn the government for every wrong from racism to genocide, and then propose that an even bigger government take over all productive facilities. Industry and business, also grabbing for the claimed efficiencies of scale, have become so concentra concentrated in an ownership that just 2,000, 1% of the 200,000 American industrial corporations now account for about 90% of an of annual profits and about the same proportion of total assets. Yet products are more and more seen as sleazy and advertising depends on the rankest appeals to push products. The people who design and make them are increasingly bored silly and dissatisfied with what they do. Alcoholism, narcotic addiction, suicide, divorce, and sabotage rise as the production lines go faster. Television, with its creativity captured by three commercial networks and one politically controlled public one, shifts back and forth between mediocrity and ho-hum while entertainers make in a year what poets, scientists, and farmers make in a lifetime. Corporate farms replace family farms. Crops are grown more and more in great area-wide clumps or even in separate countries. Tomatoes in the Bahamas, asparagus in Mexico. Famine stalks the earth. Blights sweep the giant farms, and machines that have replaced farmers prove incapable of functioning with care and sense, as witnessed the corporate-scale farming of the Soviet Union. Small business perishes, and with it, freedom of enterprise as conglomerate, conglomerate managements and agreements replace old-fashioned marketing. Product differentiation replaces actual innovation and style dominates over serviceability or need. Even neighborliness and friend friendship have gr become gripped by the sy symptoms of growth and so that simple affection of people for each other is replaced by the new industries of introspection, meditation, faddish indulgence, singles bars, dating companies, and pleasure consultants. Finally, the places where we live become simply real estate, places primarily for speculation. The good town is the growing town, even if the growth displaces the re residents and scatters them to other centers, pays them well for property abandoned, then charges them even more for property to replace it. And like a final blow to the old American dream, the possibility of e even having a house to live in is now said to be beyond the reach of most of us. Progress. Growth. Moving on. Growing up and up and up. In pathology, one form of unlimited growth is known as cancer. To many a chamber of commerce, unlimited growth is still called progress. Yet people by themselves, not as parts of institutions, which led the cheering for all this concentration and growth, people by themselves keep going elsewhere. Some townspeople simply shut the door, no more growth. Some young people declare that community, not success, is their goal. Small business is suddenly a countercultural phenomenon. Family farms are said to be the mark of the new pioneers. All of these matters are discernible in the ordinary course of things. 
they do not require scholarly research to at least to see the outlines. The outlines of the discontents are ordinary table talk. So are the outlines of simmering hopes and the shimmering dreams and the changes. At the heart of it all lies what seems to me an inescapable observation. People feel vague and dissatisfied, troubled, when their work seems to have no meaning or to be just part of some interchangeable, inexplicable machine, when their life shrinks into the confines of a single house or apartment, when neighborliness is lost, when all life seems compartmentalized, packaged, processed, when anonymity seems to be the name of the game and one's name becomes a number. The equally inescapable alternative would be community, understandable work, friends, some place to stand, reason to stand up, and a certainty of being counted, of being heard, of being recognizable and not an indistinguishable part of the whole. It does not seem much to ask to be a whole person in a whole world, yet the world would have to change to make that possible. Is it possible? I am convinced that it is. Possible, practical, not pie in the sky, but something for here and now. The two crucial elements are community and technology. A place in which and a way in which people can live peacefully, socially, cooperatively, and tools and techniques to provide the necessary, necessary material base for that way of living. Communities, of course, are human work. They arise from human decisions and interactions. But what about technology, knowledge, knowing how to do things and making the things with which to do them? They are seen so commonly as the results of institutional arrangements that viewing them as community enterprises requires what seem, may seem sh a shocking reassessment. This book is for people who want to at least consider such a reassessment. For any who do, there is an initially comforting thought. You, we, are not alone. Thinking about community and thinking about the technologies appropriate to community is something people are doing in increasing, if not yet overwhelming, numbers everywhere on Earth. Most are not impelled by ideological theories. They are doing it for a very simple and a very decent, very human reason. There really doesn't seem to be any other way to go these days. All the grand theories of central authority, of pyramids of power, ideological purifications, growth, bigness, and progress have been tried. Here we are, knowing that things just aren't working. Because this is a book about technology which has very personal dimensions, it requires a personal statement at the beginning. Unfortunately, it is likely to sound outrageous. If it does, please understand that it derives from experience and not from ideological frenzy. Like most of us, I have worked very hard and very long under the impression that the bigger anything is, the bigger it, better it is. I have worked very hard and very long under the impression that success is money, that time is money, that progress is money, and that money is wealth. You know all of these things. We grow up knowing these things. In fact, when we know these things, we are said to have grown up. We see technology as a tool to do it all, to make things bigger, to make more money, to save more time. And we see technology as a way of accomplishing everything, as an entire way of thinking. With the time we save, we have leisure, and with that leisure we have new technologies of recreation. When the recreation palls, we have new technologies of introspection and analysis to discover why it palls and, in fact, in effect, to provide a new recreation to fill all that time that we saved, but which, come to think about it, we are too rushed to enjoy. Perhaps then we turn to the technologies of narcotic tranquility. Above all, we see technology, most of us, as something remote, another product, built in another factory, something we can buy, like food, like 
satisfaction, like respect. I'm convinced now that there are other possibilities. I've worked enough at practical development and deployment of them to see them as wholly available as alternatives here and now. It is possible for us, working together in social institutions of various sizes according to our preferences, to spend our time almost exactly as we want to. The rules and imperatives that conventional wisdom fasten on us are not binding except to the extent that we let them be. Technologies, ways of working, kinds of tools can be developed, deployed, and maintained at the community level. Communities founded upon ways of life that reflect the values and aspirations of the people who compose the community can take long steps toward exactly the degree of self-reliance that will best serve the purposes of the community. Communities can, without complex social controls, cooperate with other communities to provide things that are not locally available, to enlarge cultures, to do anything that will enhance the community without destroying it. There are no shortages of anything on the face of the earth that would prevent any community from surviving healthily and happy. If you say, aha, there are shortages of petrochemicals so severe that not everyone can have them. The obvious answer is that not everyone needs them. There are other fuels. There are other chemicals. Petrochemicals seem essential not because of the technology so good that everyone must have it, but because of a technology so poor that it has become inflexible, dependent, and stultified. The petrochemical industry is a monument to the folly of putting all of our technological eggs in one huge basket. That huge basket is corporate and state domination of technology. This book is an argument for community participation, with all of the diversity and resulting flexibilities that that implies. Technology, to hear most public descriptions and discussions of it, is concerned solely with the great institutions. National strength, corporate progress, gross national product, national security, state of knowledge. You can practically, practically hear all the trumpets blaring and see the thrones of power glistening at the end of majestic red carpets. Ta-ra, ta-ra. So long as technology actually seems that remote and that majestic, it will not serve us. Like a monarch, it will rule us. Rather, those who manage it will, will rule us. Fact is that technology is simply the way we use tools, actual tools in the material sense, and tools of knowledge in the sense of skills and craft and technique. It is not majestic. It is quite earthy. It is not remote. It involves us all. It involves shopkeepers and crowded cities. It involves farmhands. It involves kids, everyone, people here, people around the world. We are all tool users and knowledge users. From the tribal farmer scratching a seed furrow with a pointed stick to the high-energy physicist aligning a particle accelerator, from the shaman to the molecular biologist. Science is another matter. It is a process, one way of observing the natural world, conjecturing about relationships in the natural world, rigorously testing those conjectures, and then making predictions as to performance and occurrence on the basis of those tested conjectures. It is also the process by which, over time, virtually every conjecture, even after acceptance, has been replaced by another. Science is the way of thinking. Science is the way of doing work. Science is when someone, on the basis of a long-tested theory or conjecture, predicts it will take so much energy to drive a certain nail into a certain piece of wood, other scientific probing having established descriptions of energy and for the hardness of wood. Technology is when someone attaches a dense material such as a metal to a hand-suitable material such as wood, tubular steel, or fiberglass to produce the hammer that will impart the arm's energy to the nail. 
a device that involves another technology based on the scientific notions of friction, which is a theory, and so on and so on. Today, both science and technology are part of a public schizophrenia that is deranging as the that is as deranging as the private kind. On the one hand, virtually all politicians and managers of great economic power, such as the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the DuPonts, and the Fords, seem to regard science and technology as twin goddesses lighting the sky for the greater glory of capital expansion and the empire of businesses around the world. Socialist politicians and businessmen or ministers of this or that, as they prefer to call themselves, share exactly the same respect for science and technology, and for exactly the same reasons, but with different labels affixed. Socialists and capitalists alike, for instance, feel that the nation, national strength is simply a function of national defense, which in turn is just derived from the nation's state of technological know-how. They also feel that no matter what the problem, pollution, for instance, there will someday be a technological cure. So, therefore, there really are no problems, just political priorities. Counter to all that are the people who hate science and technology. They reason that science and technology got us into whatever fix we are in, can get only get us in deeper, and should now give away to other ways of thinking and working in order to save our souls and our lives. They ascribe to science a way of thinking which obliterates human consideration. They ascribe a te to technology a way of working which obliterates concern for nature. To make the point of this book, it is necessary to oppose both these views, the capitalist socialist one and the hate science and technology one. The point is that there is no reason in nature, in organization, or in science and technology for human beings to live, to lead second-hand lives, under second-party rules, in second-class communities. Instead, there is every reason, if they choose to, that human beings can participate fully in all the decisions that affect their lives, be responsible for their lives, and with other human beings live in precisely the communities suited to their capabilities, and cares rather than bound to someone else's advantage or blueprint. This hardly means sort of a reckless freedom of choice based only upon desire. It does not suggest wish wishful thinking as the basis of society. It is meant to suggest responsible capability as the basis. Freedom of choice thus based means that we then when people choose the shape of the community they must also be prepared and be capable of building that shape if the choice is made in freedom and if others enjoy an equivalent freedom it means that responsibility must be borne by those directly involved and cannot be fulfilled by denying freedoms of others freedom of choice that suggests that freedom to deny freedom is, except for debating teams, an obvious travesty. Freedom of choice otherwise just might be the death of a free society. If, as it surely has, freedom of choice has come to mean freedom to choose between already existing situations in the development of which you were not directly involved, then it does not reflect a free society at all, but rather an ordered society. Freedom to create would seem to me a better demand for a free society. Even the necessity to create, the necessity to make choices by actually making actions rather than just picking products, whether social or concrete. America today is a technologically backward nation. It has lots of technology. But the technology is largely frivolous, serving corporate caprices. The technology has become very much like the politics. There's a lot of it. Technology and politics everywhere. In every nook and cranny of our lives. In every ticking second of our times. 
but the politics is frivolous too. It serves the ur urges of the two major political parties, the egos of the principal players in them, and the big businessmen who pay for it all out of profits made from the use of the technology. The situations really do go together. The kind of technology that is possible, and which would suit the old, old yearnings of the American dream, is exactly the kind that would undermine the sort of spectator sport politics we have come to play. It would be a technology in which ordinary people participated very actively. It would be a tool to serve their purposes and make possible the kinds of lives they, and not Madison Avenue, want to live. Having a role in the development, deployment, and maintenance of technology, wouldn't people also want more of a role in politics? Wouldn't they want a politics that makes possible a democratic life, rather than politics that makes necessary a life subordinated to the poli not politics, but to the politicians? In politics, a person is not a citizen if the person's only function is to vote. Voters choose people who, in turn, act like citizens. They argue, they establish the forms with, in which people live their lives, they make politics. The people who merely vote for them merely make politicians. People who argue for their positions in a town meeting are acting like consumers picking between prepackaged political items. They had nothing to do with the items. All they can do is pick what is. They cannot actively participate in making what should be. In technology, there is the same thing. To be merely a consumer of technology is to always accept and take what is and never to shape what could be. Invention, science, the arts, civil life, all can be enjoyed at smaller levels of social organization at the community level. Much of the be best we have ever enjoyed in all of those fields comes from small, not large, arrange arrangements of work, research, education, and society. Personal security, the great hobgoblin which often scares people into giving up freedom for some claimed increase in safety, can actually be provided more satisfyingly and more sh surely at smaller levels of arrangements, particularly at the community level. Even the security of major geographical area, covering literally thousands of communities the size of a modern nation-state, could be provided in a military sense at the level of organization perhaps a tenth as great as the one which today threatens to engulf us in a regimented society without the enemy having fired a shot or issued an order. I make an assumption in all this. Most people would prefer to live in a social setting where they know their neighbors, enjoy their work, and have a full voice in discussing the terms under which the work is done and the living is lived. I have another assumption that attaches to that. Such arrangements are structurally impossible in some social organizations. The point at which the scale changes is simply the point at which the purposes of all the people involved or the purposes of the institution and its institutional leaders become dominant. Numerical size is no gauge to this. A uh, Spanish trade union, the CNT, with a membership of a million, once had only two paid employees. The purposes of the members dominated. On the other hand, in some very small communities, a single family or a company may totally dominate. Generally speaking, however, sheer scale does at least tilt things toward command and away from democracy. There is an obvious problem in imagining that the purposes of any group of people, large or small, ever will be so constant as to enable agreement in a community. I, for one, do not imagine any such con constancy. The individual purposes and 
predilections of people in the community are kaleidoscopic. However, if it if a basic purpose of the community is to be a community, and if there is some shared respect for the neighbors in the neighborhood, then the multitude of other differences can be and will be argued and resolved without tearing apart the founding purpose. In short, is the purpose of the community that undergirds the proposition not any supposition that there won't be any differences. If, of course, the differences ever become so pro powerful that they challenge the underlying purpose, so be it. The community is then upon a reef and might as well have split apart in order to disengage. But then all you have is two communities, each still presumably united at bottom by the same purpose as the old one, to have a community of shared respect. Another way of putting this is geometrically. If the organization, regardless of numerical scale, is organized like a pyramid, with power running down from the top and obedience at the base, then the administrative scale is big, a larger number of people controlled by the smaller number. If the shape is spherical, with power adhering to all of the particles in it, and with no way to establish an up and down order, then the scale is small, with decision making involving the smallest of all social units, the individual, all of the individuals. After the assumption that people do indeed want to live in a community, rather than anonymously in some sort of social conglomerate, the remainder of my arguments are not as assumptions, but practical propositions. They are not based upon things that lie in the future, on tools not yet discovered or used, on principles yet to be spelled out. They are based on what we have and what we are today. Still, it seems discordant. If possible and practical, why not present and palpable? If it isn't just dreaming, then why does present reality seem so immutable? No doubt about it. There is, in any discussion of what could be, an overwhelming sense of things as they are, and powerful variations on the theme. I often find myself asking why something isn't done differently, only to hear the answer that 1. There are rules against it. 2. That's not the way we do it. 3. Human nature just doesn't work that way. 4. It costs too much. 5. It's too simple. Meaning my suggestion, of course. 6. It's too complex. Meaning the thing being questioned, of course. 7. You just can't, that's all. 8. Well, I can't explain why not, but that's the way it is. And besides, if I have to explain it to you, you wouldn't understand anyway. 9. People just can't do things like that on their own. A. Because they don't want the responsibility. B. Because they aren't smart enough. C. Because they'd rather watch TV. D. Because they won't let them. Reality is defined in all of those propositions as the way things are, in a purely administrative sense. None of those prop propositions, not even the one about human nature, describes any hard and fast material reality. Rules are made by people. People can change them, and not necessarily the same people that made them. The way things are done is often the result of habit, custom, or old rules. Habits can be broken. Custom that is not based upon some material imperative can be changed. Cost is a bookkeeping matter. It is the result of social agreements and is not part of the natural or material world. Costs are what a particular value system says they are. Paying as much for a painting as for the saving of a life is the result of a particular value system always susceptible to change, 
and not the result of something handed to us by nature, physics, chemistry, biology, botany, physiology, or even psychology. One person's priceless psychological security is another person's wasteland. Simplicity is not necessarily a curse. In the natural world, simple rather than complex answers are more the rule than the exception. It would be incredibly complex to ask the human mind consciously to direct the functioning of all the bodily parts, even though it might be satisfying to a certain managerial urge. On the contrary, the vital organs and the cells generally operate pretty much on their own, doing their job so long as they can, can without hierarchical, hierarchical structuring and coercion. Photosynthesis, which simply is, is a lot simpler than having the federal government or General Motors try to create nourishment from scratch. Complexity, on the other hand, is by now a familiar managerial defense against anything in which there is a suggestion that people generally can understand, operate, or change any process controlled by someone who wants to keep the controls firmly in hand. One reasonable response to a claim of complexity is to ask for clarification. The imperious you can't is just that. An exercise of authority, not of reason. It is part of reality in about the same way the Inquisition, Inquisition was a part of religion. Again, it may be a real force, but it is a force that emerges from human purpose, which is changeable, rather than a material or natural imperative which might not be nearly so flexible. It is possible by an exercise of human purpose to stop using petrochemicals as fuel. It is not possible by an act of human purpose to extend the availability of such chemicals beyond their actual availability in the natural world. Things that cannot be explained are the things that cannot be explained, and need not detain anyone interested in reality unless that interest focus entirely on the inability of some people to say what they mean. The idea that people can't, won't, or never have done something because most people are this way, or that sometimes people are least rooted in reality. Unless you begin to call that people have, over time, acted in so many different ways, and have, even over short times, changed in so many ways as to seem to have almost limitless possibilities. Certainly there is nothing to suggest that their ways of working and living together are inscribed irrevocably in their DNA. If so, we could scarcely discuss the matter at all. The most acute part of my own reality problem lies in the suggestion that they won't let there be any change. We all define them differently, of course. I am prepared to admit, as fervently as you wish, that there are some people who have mighty interests against letting anything change, and those whose very lifestyles are founded upon putting down any upstart suggestions that might set the apple cart to wobbling. Some welfare recipients or pensioners can be understood as not wanting anything to change because of the cynical conviction that it would just get worse. The Rockefeller family hardly seems eager to change for change in the world, unless it is simply a reinforcing of the vast system of wealth which is their own welfare system, making it handily unnecessary to work except as whim dictates. But understanding that to be part of reality is a shallow thing, if it is not accompanied by a deeper appreciation of a reality in which all idlers on earth, to continue with that example, do not amount to any great numerical shakes. The reality is, when most people want something to change, it will change. A few muttering malcontents could scarcely stop it. 
particularly if the muttering comes from people who are clearly not among the most energetic or creative, but actually the least, as it is the case of the idle rich or the given up poor. Much of the criticism leveled against this book will call it unrealistic dreaming. Accepted. If the real world is only the world of administrative decision, then I do have a reality problem, and I am properly disregarded as simple ass braying in the distant boonie. If, however, the real world is based not altogether upon desire, but also upon material reality, in what we know of it, such as physics and chemistry, etc., and what we think of it, such as poetry and philosophy, then administration may be seen as merely one sort of effective opinion and not the law of nature after all. If that is the case, and this book will try to make it, then the criticism of these speculations as unrealistic should be changed to saying that they are merely unpopular. And that, in turn, might be modified to saying, unpopular right now, but maybe not tomorrow. To pick up your copy of Community Technology by Carl Hess, just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash Hess. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash Hess. And make sure to check out our entire catalog uh, for our full selection of books pertaining to self-liberation, uh, Vanu, and uh, you know, great libertarian history and philosophy. Uh, again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash Hess.